Good morning, genealogy friends. Happy Monday. We're talk talking about digitizing today. So I think it's going to be another good one. I mean, you guys are kind of at the mercy of things that I find interesting. Uh, I actually, I have a request list. I've written down a list of things that people have asked for in comments. Um, and I will be getting through those. I just uh, had my own list, I guess, <laughs> that we're kind of going through. But if you have asked for something or if you have something in mind, go ahead and leave it or just know that I am not ignoring you. I just am doing another one that I wanted to do today, which sounds kind of terrible, but I promise it'll be interesting. Let me flip this around. Good morning. Ooh, got the cold weather Utah look this morning. Um, I hope that you're well. I hope that you had a nice weekend. I had a very good weekend, most of which was actually spent offline, which is kind of unusual for me. Did a lot of stuff around the house. Uh, updates, news. We talked about the book and the course last week, but if you missed the announcement, book and course not coming out until January, course not starting until February. Uh, I had somebody ask me about Black Friday yesterday or the day before and whether or not I'll be having a sale. And I mulled it over for the weekend. Um, I will be running a special on Black Friday. So I'm not going to give any details. Keep it exciting. Um, I will say it's not going to be like a coupon code that takes a certain percentage off of the entire purchase. I thought about that. To be honest, I really don't like discounting my pages, and it's not just because I'd rather you guys paid full price for them. Um, the hard thing about running coupons and discounts and stuff like that all the time is that then it's a very uneven, one, I don't want people to delay their family history work or their interest in family history because they're waiting for a better deal, two, you know, it's slightly unfair for the people that paid the full price to, you know, then turn around and make everything cheaper. That being said, I love Black Friday. I'm a Black Friday aficionado. I have a list of companies that I am going to be looking at on Black Friday in the hopes that they're running sales. So I think once a year, I can definitely do something. Anyway, though, it's not going to be a coupon code and it's not going to affect single pages, which includes all of the new pages that are coming out. I've got more new pages coming out on Wednesday. Um, so if you've been waiting on the single pages, the new pages that are coming out, the pages that basically aren't included in the deluxe bundle, there will be no special or anything on those for Black Friday. So don't, don't delay if you were looking at spending the $2 or $5 or whatever for one of the newer bundles. Uh, and we'll talk about the new pages coming out on Wednesday. On Wednesday, I'm, I'm not gonna, no reason to get into that now. Plenty of time on Wednesday for that. Maybe I'll also tackle one of the request topics on Wednesday. Maybe, or maybe I'll talk about something Thanksgiving-y. Those of you not in the US, uh, this Thursday is our Thanksgiving. So my kids are having a short week at school and we'll be doing holiday stuff, but I'm still planning on teaching Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of this week. Okay, so let's talk about digitizing. Um, I talk really often about digitizing on here as far as I talk about the fact that I want you guys to digitize everything. But then, I mean, what does that really mean when I say, okay, digitize all the things, go, go forth and digitize. Um, that can seem like a really overwhelming task, especially if you haven't made very much progress with digitizing or if you uh, don't feel that comfortable with technology, you know, maybe you kind of felt like you sort of tried to digitize th something 10 years ago and now you're under the impression that not only do you have to digitize more things, but maybe the things you scanned 10 years ago weren't good enough and then that just seems like, oh, well then why bother? So let's talk about that because I can totally see how that would happen. Um, it's kind of the problem with technology. The good news is that technology is easier than ever to use and the things that are being produced by technology right now are gonna last for a really long time. So it's a really good time to get started or to keep going if you've started digitizing and then taken a long break. Um, okay, why digitize something? So you wanna digitize things uh, because you wanna protect them from being lost. This is why you wanna digitize photos, letters, all sorts of things. But you also wanna digitize heirloom objects, you know, physical, tangible. Basically, if 
your house caught on fire and you lost it and you'd be sad, then you need to digitize it. Um, so for most of us, that's a whole lot of stuff, but that's the main reason for digitizing. Digitizing also preserves items as they are right now. Uh, if you have photos, they will continue to fade. They'll continue to get more brittle. If you have clothing items, they will continue to get older. Um, some of you might have seen last year or about a year and a half ago, I shared that my stepfather had stored his grandfather's World War I uniform in this old trunk that belonged to his grandmother or great-grandmother. Um, and we had pulled it out once or twice. I mean, he'd pulled it out for me the first time I remember when I was younger, not too long after we met, because even as a child, I was a history buff. So we all knew that it was in there. And I had sort of said, oh, you know, we should really store that somewhere else. But then we just put it back in the trunk and put it in their nice, um, you know, temperature controlled garage. Moths got to it and it's all chewed up. We're trying to figure out now how to like frame it or do something so that we can continue sharing it. But it basically got destroyed and it, it was really sad. So um, digitizing something like that, I, I don't have a photograph. I never laid it out and took a photograph of it because it was always just the uniform that was in the trunk. And so I we have no, other than the photographs we have of him in it, uh, my, you know, my great step, great grandfather, um, we don't have any photos of it. So that would have been a good thing to digitize. And then the thing about digitizing uh, that's really nice is that it makes things shareable. If you have, a one-of-a-kind family photograph or family album, or if you were lucky enough to inherit something special, um, photographing that item, scanning those items, that gives you a way to share the item with extended family members or, you know, add it to some sort of family tree notebook or publication or something so that you can share it. Digitizing also, in a weird way, kind of frees you up to actually share the item. You know, those of us who... It's funny because I'm a huge history buff, but I'm also a mom of three, and we live in a totally reasonable, very nice, but older, slightly smaller house in the suburbs here in Salt Lake. And I just can't keep all of the things that I would want to keep. Um, digitizing stuff lets me enjoy it and then pass on and share the stuff that I don't I don't want to have in my house or that maybe I, I'm worried that I don't even have the right kind of storage for. So... Um, that's another thing to think about with digitizing. So when you're thinking about, okay, so how do I digitize these things? Um, if you really don't want to do it yourself, you don't trust yourself uh, for the quality or the skill or the time or whatever, if you just don't want to do it, there's a lot of digitizing services. There are national ones that get a lot of attention and press. Um, I mean, I don't really want to name... I'm not naming any of these because I'm recommending them because I've never used a digitizing service. But uh, I'm trying to, what are they even called? Like there's the legacy, is it legacy box? I also probably shouldn't name them because I don't know the names of them. I know that Kodak has one. Uh, Costco will do it, things like that. You can also find a lot of local digitizing services. I'm pretty sure everywhere. I mean, especially here in Salt Lake City because we are genealogy obsessed here. But the nice thing about a local place is that instead of mailing your stuff off, you can usually just drive it over and drop it off. And then you have a sense of, you know, where your heirlooms are in the city. The downside to local digitizing is, of course, they don't have the big national brand reputation. So sometimes, you know, if there's a problem, maybe the customer service isn't as good. You know, all of the problems that you run in with businesses, if you are dropping your stuff off, um, that I, I've huge control issues, personality thing. So that's why I've never used one because I want to hang on to all my stuff and do it myself. But obviously, I mean, these people are not in business to ruin your family memories. They have the technology. They, you know, you can find people who have been in business for a long time. Like I don't want to pass on my anxieties about that because digitizing services provide a great service to the community and they can be a great option, especially if it's between using a digitizing service and just not digitizing your stuff. Then obviously you should use a digitizing service for things that are harder. Like, um, I'll actually walk around at the end of this and show you some of the stuff that I need to digitize that isn't a photograph or a letter or something flat that you scan you can hire a professional photographer to come in and take really nice photos of things and, you know, use those photos for your own records. <clears throat> um, people don't think about that, but if you don't have a high quality camera or you just don't trust your photography skills, hiring a professional photographer to come in is definitely an option for you. Um, 
I mean, you could also even find a friend or some college kid with a nice camera or something, but professional photographers, it's more than just pointing a camera at something and taking a picture. So that's an option. If you wanna do it yourself, then you're looking at buying a nice photo scanner. If you have negatives or slides to scan, then you wanna make sure that you get a scanner that has like a transparency where the light actually shines through stuff as you scan it. Um, I have a Canon photo scanner that I use for photos and an Epson transparency scanner that I use for slides and negatives. Um, you are also looking at um, getting, you could do video converting yourself, which means you take VHS tapes uh, and convert them to movie files. I've done one, I've done videos before on the, um, the Wolverine, what do you, I guess it's converter, film converter that I use to um, digitize eight millimeter and super eight film. Um, so all of those are different, you know, toys that you can use depending on how much you have to digitize. It really, some of these things can be expensive, but digitizing services can be expensive if you have a lot to digitize. So make sure that you explore what the costs are. Um, if you have tons of things to digitize, digitizing services can easily get up into $1,000. So it might be worth it for you to spend the money on the technology. I'm also, I wanted to talk about this. I should have started with this. I wanted to talk about this because a lot of these things that you might need for digitizing, um, scanners, uh, high quality cameras, if you want to take your own photos, all of these cables and video converting things. Uh, with Black Friday coming up, a lot of that stuff's gonna be on sale. You also might be able to find Black Friday specials from digitizing companies. So since this is a place where there's often an initial investment, I thought that this would be a good time to talk about that so that you can start thinking about if that's something that you want to plan on for Black Friday spending or if you wanted to add it to your gift list. Um, I know my husband and I are currently trying to figure out if we're gonna get each other something nice or if we're going to chip in together and get something nice for the household. Um, this is the kind of time when we would spend the money and get a nice camera. I have a nice camera. I think we actually got last year, sorry. Oh, I think about my eyelash my eye. Um, anyway, that's why I wanted to talk about that. Okay, so what do you digitize first? Because if you're looking at your whole household and you really haven't made much progress, you don't just grab the first photo album or the first stack of papers off of the top and start digitizing unless you're really committed to going from top to bottom. Because if you run out of energy with digitizing, if you run out of time and then you think, okay, well, I'll finish the rest of it later, you wanna make sure that you digitized your priorities first. So you wanna do your at-risk items first. So the first things that I digitized um, I mean, there are things I haven't digitized, and I'll talk about that at the end, but what I have digitized, I've digitized the oldest photos. I have digitized photos that are in, and pa papers and things like that, that were in really bad condition because they were stored badly. Um, so old photo albums, old letters, old military documents, that kind of stuff has all been digitized. Uh, I have tried to digitize as much audiovisual stuff as I could, which includes... Um, VHS tapes, um, eight millimeter film, things like that. So here's something interesting. When we think about home movies deteriorating, I think a lot of people think film first and you should, uh, old eight millimeter, millimeter and super eight film. It's getting older by the minute. It can get more brittle. It's harder to digitize and you can lose quality. One of the fastest deteriorating things though is actually VHS tapes. And if you have a VHS tape, a lot of people had their home movies converted to VHS tapes from eight millimeters so they could continue to enjoy them in the 80s and 90s. If your family has done that, if you have access to the original eight millimeter Super 8, it's better to digitize that than to digitize the VHS tapes. VHS tapes do not last. It's not any fault against them, but they don't. And um, in addition to the fact that it's getting harder to find VCRs, which I feel like I keep talking about, but it really is. Um, VHS tapes are, there. it's magnetic information. It's information on a magnetic tape that runs through a plastic cassette that is also kind of open to dust and debris. Basically, everything about VHS tapes is frustrating because 
the magnetic tape is very, very, very prone to damage and to falling apart and to just losing quality. Audio cassette tapes work the same way. If you have an interview or I have an audio cassette tape that I don't know why or what they were doing or whatever, it's my cousin and I, when we're very little, maybe two or three, and they, our parents, my mom and her sister recorded us talking back and forth. Um, the, the tape on that, it will continue to deteriorate. How do you digitize an audio cassette tape? High quality, there are people that have machines that can turn them into audio files, things like that. Low quality, you stick it in a cassette player, you point a video camera at it and you hit record. You want to record these things somehow because that stuff is falling apart. What people might not realize though is that if you have a DVD or a CD that maybe at some point somebody scanned a lot of photos and they put them on a DVD or a CD for you, or they digitized your home movies and then you purchase this DVD. I have unfortunate news for you. CDs and DVDs have the same problem that VHS and audio tapes have. They're gonna last longer than your VHS and your audio tapes, but DVD, I almost called them DVD cassettes, DVD um, discs, which is probably, I'm repeating myself, digital video discs, compact discs, discs, discs and CDs, uh, they're magnetic. That's what they are. They're magnetic information that's just in a different form. They're deteriorating. We don't talk about that a lot because they, CDs and DVDs have been out for the right amount of time to start deteriorating. But in 20 years, we're gonna have the same problem with those that we have with VHS tapes. And people don't really talk about that. And so I think people don't know that. And there's this idea that if you've got stuff on a DVD, it's safe, you've done it, it's digitized. Not so much. Now, if you're gonna do priorities, which is more in trouble, the VHS tapes or the DVDs? Well, the VHS tapes, so digitize those first. But just, I'm just telling you, DVDs and CDs are not as safe as we think they are. I don't wanna be the harbinger of digitizing doom, but um, there is this idea that 100 years from now, the DVDs are still gonna work. That would be nice for a lot of DVDs, it's not gonna be true, so. Okay, so what do you, uh, what do you do once you figure it out what you wanna prioritize? You wanna scan the, scan at the highest resolution um, that your scanner will go up to. For mine, I scan at 600 DPI and I turn them into JPEG files. There are scanners that go higher. 600 has worked for me and it's I think it's fine. Uh, scan to a universally used file format. I use JPEG. A lot of people use TIFF. Let's talk about the differences because JPEG and TIFF are the two that you should, don't don't scan to anything else. Don't scan to PNGs. Um, different image file formats are used for different things. TIFF files are higher quality. TIFF files um, are, they are like a better image. So why do I use JPEGs? TIFF files are very, very large because they're packing a lot of information into one image file. They take longer to create, they take longer to transfer, and they take up more storage when you store them. I scan and digitize a ton of photos and different media and things like that. Um, doing TIFF files would add too much extra time to my scanning process and it would add too much extra storage to the storage that I pay for to make it worth it. When JPEGs work for me, JPEGs that are scanned at a good high resolution blow up beautifully when you want to have framed photos. Um, I always scan once and create like a high quality master file at the absolute highest level. And then if I need to shrink them to share them on Facebook or to send them to somebody or something like that, I will take that high master file and I'll just make a smaller version and save it separately. I never touch. The whole idea is that I scan things once. The thing that I scanned is then put away or stored however I need to store it. And then that master file is never touched except to make other smaller copies. But um, yeah, JPEGs have always worked for me and I've decided that it just makes more sense for me to keep using JPEGs and to sacrifice a little bit of visual quality which is not perceptible to the human eye under most circumstances, unless I was gonna wallpaper my room with one photo um, versus having to spend the extra time to create TIFF files and then spending the space to store them. I mean, if you wanted to email a TIFF file to somebody, they're too big. So 
But people like professional archivists, things like that, they will use TIFF files because they are the absolute best. So if you're ever wondering, should I be using a TIFF or a JPEG, that's what people are doing. Um, when you talk about PNG files, those are really more used for designers, for graphics. Um, PNGs are used for you know, by bloggers to put up web images. I will save one of my high master JPEGs as a PNG occasionally to share it online, but I'm not scanning things and saving them as PNGs. Um, make sure that when you're scanning that you're scanning the back of photos. If there's any information on there that includes just a date or the name of a photographer studio or something like that, even if it's not the actual name of the people that are in the photo, you still wanna scan the back of the photo so that you have that, you don't wanna lose it. And then once you have these scanned, you wanna make sure that you're saving them in multiple places. So, and that's true for whether you're taking photos of items, um, everything that comes out of you digitizing, don't just save it in one place. Do not just save it to your computer. I know that it's tempting. Computers just die. Computers are unfortunately delicate and suicidal. Um, I have buried many a computer. <clears throat> you want to have that, I mean, best case scenario, this is what I do. I scan to my computer once I'm finished scanning for the day or honestly, if I'm scanning a ton, maybe I've scanned for an hour or two. I take those files, I copy them to a hard drive that I use only for saving photos I copy them to a second hard drive that I also use only for saving photos. Yes, I have two, two terabyte hard drives that I use for saving photos because I'm that obsessed with them. I upload them to Google Photos, which I have decided that I'm comfortable with. I have a different video on that if you want to talk about that. And then I upload them to Dropbox. So one scanned photo is then saved in four different places. And I mean, it would take at that point an apocalyptic event affecting both my house and two different companies for me to lose that photo. That might be a little bit extreme. It's how I sleep at night. So that's what I would recommend. Um, okay, so that was a lot of the like, the why digitize, and then I was also being scary about VHS tapes. But if you're just thinking, okay, so, but really what do I digitize? I got a whole house full of stuff. Um, I don't have you know anything super antique like you were talking about. I just have stuff, so where do I start? Start with things that are popular and well used first because they're the things that are gonna be at risk for uh, showing more age and damage later. So if you've got a photo album that people absolutely love to look through, scan that, scan those photos. Um, my mom wrote a children's book with her sister when she was little. She wrote the book and her sister did the illustrations. And I used to love looking through that when I was little. So I digitized that because that's sharing, that's showing a lot of wear. Uh, if you have things that are unique, if you've got tin types, um, amber types, daguerreotypes, uh, photos like this, that convex portrait I did take down and um, did a little photo session with, you want to digitize those things because if you lose them, you lose them and everybody loses them. Um, after that, maybe digitize things that really resonate with your family or with a specific community. That could be um, digitizing military photos and sharing them. If you want to share them with family to talk about military service, if you have a church community that is really important to you and you have something that would be important to that church community, my grandparents were founding members of a church in Napa, and so I have photos of the them actually breaking ground on that church and then documents about that church, and I digitized those and then shared them with the church um, to have in their own history files, and they were really appreciative of that. Um, digitize things that deteriorate. That's, again, not going to keep getting scary about VHS tapes and DVDs and stuff, although I guess I will occasionally be scary. I'm going to be like the ghost of... Christmas digitizing. Um, you want to digitize things that are hard to use. That would be scrapbooks that are falling apart. I feel like almost all of us have photo albums or scrapbooks where it's like you know that you don't even necessarily want to take it off the shelf because little pieces of paper are going to fall out of it. Um, you want to digitize those things so that you can just stop touching them. Um, yeah, same for things that are, you know, photos that are on the wall that are getting super faded from the sun and stuff. Digitize that stuff. Uh, and then randomly, so just a couple more things. Sorry, I feel like I'm doing that thing where I'm talking too long, but if you have photo negatives and you have photo prints, you know, you've got negatives and you've got the prints from the negatives, 
scan them all. Um, if you're thinking, why would I scan a negative if I've already scanned the print? If you actually have to pick between one, most people don't know this, you wanna scan the negative. Why? Because prints are reliant on the technology that was used to print that photo at that time. It also means if you've ever gotten prints printed at a professional photographer versus the one hour photo that, I don't, one hour photo I feel like isn't even at the grocery store. Okay, sorry, I think I'm still live. My mother was trying to call me. <laughs> She's probably gonna call back in a minute when I don't answer. She always assumes that I'm trapped under something heavy. Anyways, um, if you got, you know, Walmart one hour prints, they're not gonna be as high quality print as a professional photographer. And if you got prints in the 80s or 70s or 60s, they probably aren't as crisp as they would be if you got prints from those negatives now. The negatives hold more photo details probably than your prints. They also probably were stored better because a lot of people get negatives and they stick them in those little, you know, the flap on the photo. You guys know what I'm talking about. And people thumb through the prints or take the prints out and put them in photo albums, but a lot of people just threw the negatives in their little plastic sleeves in a box and then kind of left them around. Like, I don't really want to throw these out, but what am I ever going to do with them? So those negatives have probably been really well stored. Um, so you want to, again, you need the scanner that has the transparency that shines the light through the negative um, in order to scan it, but you're gonna get a better image from a, scan, uh, from a negative than you will from the print that the negative originally created. So that's a little funny photo tip that not a lot of people know. Um, one more thing, and I'm guilty of occasionally not doing this, especially if I'm in a hurry or there's lots of things that I'm digitizing. Uh, you want to name photo files as you go, and you don't wanna name them things like grandma, umbrella, nice day. Uh, you want to try to name the photo files with as much information as you can, and I would also include the date. Um, I'm gonna do a whole video probably at some point about naming digital files because I don't wanna get into all that now. I feel like I've already been talking forever. But basically, like let's say I had a photo album. I have a photo album of my parents we went on a cruise to Mexico. So I know it's the 1986 Mexico trip. If I was scanning all of the photos out of that album and I didn't wanna stop and take the time to actually go in and add the metadata and say, okay, this is this person, this is this person. Not that I shouldn't do that, but instead of just leaving all of the files to be named things like, you know, 1876.jpg, I would name them uh, 1986 Mexico trip one, and then probably a code for that means like the date of when I scanned it, which I always do like a full eight digit code. So like today's code, okay, I actually don't even know what the date is because we've been in our house for so long. Let's pretend it's the 20th of November, even though I don't think it is. So then that code would be 11, 20, 20, 20 for me. Um, doing that as you go, it's not that hard once you have everything scanned and they're sitting on your computer to go through and just really quickly rename the files. That can really help later if you have a random photo of somebody standing on a beach and you can't remember which album, which, you know, and you just think, okay, I know who this person is, but what are they doing? You know, even better if you go back and you add in the names of the people, but I'll do a different video on that at some point if people are interested, because naming files, I think, is something that trips people up. It's not hard. It's just that you kind of have to, like, stick to a consistent system to make it be worth it. Okay, I feel like I've been talking for two hours, but let me really quickly stand up. Ooh. Oh, sorry. This cold weather kind of affects me a lot. Um, let me talk about things that I haven't digitized because I'm a bad genealogist, bad family historian. All right, something that I could digitize. Um, I got these statues when my grandmother passed on. These would be a wonderful thing to photograph and then do a notes page about what they are, where they're from, why I saved them, things like that. Um, this was a gift when I was little. That would be another good thing to photograph. This is a funny toy that I bought my father uh, when I was young because it matched the Porsche that he had and then he gave it back to me after a while. That would be a good thing to digitize. I have a lot of things on display that are important to me but I haven't necessarily digitized them. And of course by digitizing here, I'm talking about taking professional photos. 
This is a funny thing. So I have this photo. This is my husband and I at Walt Disney World. This was taken the year that we both worked there, which was 2002. Now I have the photo digitized, but what I don't have digitized is the frame. This is the cast holiday celebration 2002 frame. It's the gift that they gave out to all the people who worked at Walt Disney World to celebrate Christmas or to celebrate the holidays. So that would be a fun thing to digitize. It's kind of like part of our history. Um, let me walk around here. These, this pitcher and goblets, that's from my parents' wedding, my biological parents. That's uh, Potter in Napa, California made those. Have not digitized them. Um, this is a Teddy Roosevelt bear that my grandfather bought from my grandmother at Yellowstone on a trip that we all enjoyed. I inherited, or my husband actually inherited when my grandmother passed because he loves Teddy Roosevelt. Um, this is my husband's, where, can you see on the end? This is my husband's grandfather's lunchbox that he took to work. Um, that would be a good thing for me to digitize. This is a jar that was from my husband's grandmother's house. Um, that would be a good thing to digitize. And then a couple of these books. These are all things that would be worth photographing. And just to point out, this, uh, this, 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 that, all those things, decorative items that I have gotten, maybe from a friend or something, but not something that's of high family historical value. So, you know, the good thing is that I guess by not digitizing it, hopefully I can signal to my children, don't save this forever. It was on clearance at Home Goods. You don't need to, you know, add it to the mom shrine if I pass away. Anyway, I hope this was helpful. Um, I really hope, I don't want to be scary or bully you into feeling bad that you haven't digitized things or that you digitized everything to DVD and now I'm telling you that that wasn't good enough. It's just that um, a big part of family history is really just trying to save things and trying to help them along so they can reach the next generation or two and that's what digitizing is. So anyway, enjoy the rest of your day. I will not be on tomorrow. Um, I don't teach on Tuesdays, but I will be back on Wednesday with more content and new pages.